anyone who is familiar with debating Christianity versus Islam normally engages in a discussion that begins with the Muslim claiming that Jesus is not God, then the Christian will proceed to show a variety of Bible verses proving the deity of Christ. Then there is normally a back and forth, and one side comes out as the victor, whilst the other one walks away disheartened and possibly doubting their faith. But this approach I am going to be taking in this video is a more historical case for Christianity. This is a video that's more focused on the earliest followers of Jesus Christ, because the easiest way to see which faith has the correct view of Jesus is to find out what the earliest followers of Jesus believed. So we are going to compare the Quranic view of Jesus with the actual historical view of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to actually begin with looking at what the Quran says about Jesus and his early followers. The Quran, without a doubt, denies the deity of Christ in chapter 5, verse 116. And it says, And beware the day when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? He will say, exalted are you. It was not for me to say that to which I had no right. <clears throat> now, firstly, let's ignore the blatant mistake here about what Christians believe about Mary. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on its view of Jesus. This is a clear denial of Christ's deity. We also see a denial of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in chapter 4, verse 157. So this is what the Quran teaches about Jesus. No deity and no crucifixion. But what does the Quran say about the earliest followers of Jesus Christ? Now, the Quran makes a huge claim about the disciples of Jesus. It says in chapter 3, verse 55, Allah said, O oh Jesus, indeed, I will take you and raise you to myself and purify you from those who disbelieve and make those who follow you superior. Now, let's think about this logically. If the Quran is really the word of God and it says that Jesus is not God and wasn't crucified and at the same time tells us that the disciples of Jesus will be superior, and that is to say, to be preserved, otherwise they would not be superior in any way, shape or form, if heretics just kind of overrun the orthodox Muslims. Then we should see in the first followers of Jesus Christ, these exact beliefs. But the question is, is that really the case? Now, let's now look at Christians after the direct disciples of Jesus Christ, some who were even taught by the apostles themselves. Let's look at what we call some of the apostolic fathers and some other information from the early church. So what did the historical early Christians, early followers of Jesus actually believe about him? Did they line up with Islam's view of Jesus as just being a good Islamic prophet? Or do they line up more with modern day Christianity? So let's look at, for example, um, let's begin with Ignatius of Antioch, for example. According to church tradition, Ignatius was a disciple of the Apostle John himself. So what he believes about Jesus is important since he learned from a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let's look at Ignatius's view. Firstly, we see an entirely different structure to the followers of Jesus than we do in Islam. For example, uh, Ignatius wrote to a number of churches on his way to martyrdom, and a key theme in Ignatius's writings is what? To obey the bishop. Ignatius even says, if you don't have a bishop, then you don't have a church. Now, this is not the way Muslims in any way, shape or form have ever governed themselves. They don't have this idea of a bishop overseeing a certain jurisdiction. They have no concept of this. So the way Ignatius viewed how the earliest followers are to govern themselves is, is entirely different to how Islam sees things. But that's a somewhat of a side issue. Let's focus on a key theme in Ignatius's writings, which of course is his divine view of Jesus Christ. He believed Jesus Christ was fully divine. He also believed in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. 
In fact, in his letter to the Ephesians, Ignatius very early on has a Christian understanding of the hypostatic union. That is to say the two natures of Jesus Christ. He says this, actually, I'll quote it now. He says, for our God, Jesus Christ, so he calls Jesus Christ our God, was conceived by Mary according to a divine purpose. So we see here, Ignatius calls Jesus God and also says that Jesus Christ was conceived by Mary, thus affirming the hypostatic union, which refutes the idea that this was made up uh, you know, this was a made up doctrine at the Council of Nicaea, for example, as many Islamic apologists will often claim. Ignatius also, in his letter to the Romans, affirms the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says this, him I seek who died for us, him I desire who rose for our sakes. So here we actually see Ignatius, a direct disciple of the Apostle John, affirming what? the deity of Christ, the hypostatic union, and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of these things are incompatible with Islam's view of Christ. Absolutely incompatible. So if we look at a direct disciple, such as Ignatius of Antioch, why is he not having this view that supposedly early Muslims or early followers of Christ, let's say, were supposed to have? Why does he not have this? That's a question we are to think about. Now let's move on to another church father to see if we can find any Islamic teaching in this father of the church. Let's look at Pope St. Clement's view of Christ. St. Clement in his letter to the Corinthians explicitly refers to Jesus Christ as God. When he says, brethren, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus Christ as of God, as the judge of the living and the dead. Now, straight off the bat here, we have Clement affirming, just as Ignatius did, the deity of Christ. This is totally incompatible with Islamic theology. Now, we also see Clement affirming another person that Muslims often refer to as the one who corrupted the true teachings of Jesus. We see St. Clement affirming the Apostle Paul and also affirming that the Apostle Paul wrote the epistle to the Corinthian church, as we have in our Bibles. When he says these words, take up the epistle of the blessed Apostle Paul. What did he write to you at the time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly under the inspiration of the spirits he wrote to you. So here St. Clement affirms as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he affirms Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and also as the Holy Spirit inspired writer of the biblical epistles to the Corinthians. Once again, this is totally incompatible with the Islamic claim on Paul and the historical view of Jesus Christ. So briefly, we have just looked at two of the earliest fathers. Okay, now there is plenty more to look at from the early fathers. We could do hours upon this but I want to move on to another interesting piece of writing, and that's the Didache. First of all, what is the Didache? The Didache is an early Christian writing that has also been called the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. Now, many scholars once dated the Didache to the late second century, but now that has changed. Most scholars are in agreement that the Didache is a first century writing. So it's an incredible piece of work to look at. So when we look at this writing, what does it say the earliest followers of Christ believed? Because this should be important. We should see in this early church document some kind of Islamic, uh, Islamic fragrance lurking around. But as you're about to see, we simply don't see that in the Didache. Now, here's a list of things the Didache says that are absolutely incompatible with the Islamic so-called Jesus. It teaches that baptism is the sacramental rite that admits someone into the church, into the Christian church. And that is to be conferred in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is often something the Muslims will attack, this Trinitarian form. But here we have this in the earliest followers of Christ. So the Muslims really need to tell us, well, why do we find this Trinitarian language? Why do we find these teachings 
in early Christian documents such as the Didache, which date back to the first century. Why do we see all of these things in these writings that contradict your view of the so-called historical Jesus? It also teaches that only those that are baptized may receive the Eucharist. Now, this is only a few things from the Didache, but you already get the picture. It's in no way Islamic whatsoever. There is no Islamic baptism. There is no Islamic baptism, especially not in the Trinitarian form. Uh, there is no sacramental rites in Islam as we do have in Christianity. This is all a foreign idea to the Islamic historical view of the so-called Jesus. I also want to take a look at briefly how the church governed itself and some of the creeds that came out of the church, which entirely contradicts Islam's view of Jesus once again you're going to see many historical things that contradicts uh, the Islamic view of Jesus if you just simply study the early church. It's quite fantastic. Many Muslims will often claim that the deity of Christ can be found nowhere before Nicaea, which is a stupid argument that could easily be refuted by anyone who has read the pre-Nicaean fathers. But what about Nicaea? Well, as we all know, Nicaea is known for condemning the heresy of Arianism. But even this heretic, Arius's view of Jesus was far too high even for the Muslim claim on Jesus Christ. They would even have to consider Arius a heretic. Now it's funny because they'll often say this kind of thing, thinking and you know believing that because there were some heretics disagreeing on Christ's deity, that this gives credibility to Islam's claim. Well, it doesn't because many of these heretics who disagreed with the church on Christ still believed in his deity, but oftentimes it was how they believed in his deity that was the problem. So even the Christological heretics would be heretics to Muslims. So to try and claim anything, you know, well, Arius disagreed and there were other church, so-called church fathers who disagreed, so, you know, this gives some credibility to our claim because, you know, we, we could be right. We're just like these guys who are disagreeing. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you're not because they would even call you heretics and you would call them heretics. It would be heretic versus heretic, basically. But what did the historical church say about the controversies? Well, of course, we end up with what we call creeds. Let's take a look at the early creeds of the church. Let's just look at the uh, Nicene Creed, for example, and let's see if there is anything in here that it, that is, uh, you know, in any way, shape, or form compatible with the Islamic view of Jesus Christ. Now, I'll read a portion of the Nicene Creed. I won't read it all, but I think what I am going to read suffices in showing that there is nothing Islamic <laughs> at all in any early creed. Now, it says this. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him, all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Now I'll stop reading the creed there, but you get the picture. The Nicene Creed has a very high Christology and contradicts Islam in many places. Now, the Muslim will say, ah, you may have the hypostatic union in that creed, but that's where it was invented. No, you do not get to say that because as I've already mentioned, we see the hypostatic union in Ignatius of Antioch. As early as Ignatius, we see the hypostatic union. So it's absolutely ridiculous to say that. But the Muslims may say, but Ben, we don't claim Nicaea was Islamic. I'm aware of that. This is not my first rodeo. But my point in all of this is this. Where are the early Islamic followers of Jesus Christ? And where are their creeds? Where are their writings? Quite frankly, they aren't to be seen. And why is that? 
Well, that's because they don't exist. There were no early followers of Jesus that were what we now call Muslims. None whatsoever. And even the Christological heretics do not resemble Islam. So quite frankly, their claim on the historical Jesus is empty. Now, if your book claims one thing and history says another, then maybe it's time to look at other options. And the only option that lines up with history is the Christian option. Now, I'll finish with this. If anyone wants to reach out and debate whether or not the early church believed Jesus was divine or not, feel free to leave a comment in this video and I will review your arguments and see if they are really worthwhile engaging with. If you're just some internet crazy person who just you know, wants to scream Council of Nicaea, I'm not really interested. But if you're a Muslim who reads the early church fathers, a Unitarian who reads the early church fathers, and you don't believe they teach Jesus is God, let's go there. Let's lace up the gloves and let's throw down. God bless.